Hello, good to see everyone here. Uh, this talk is called uh, Physical OpSec as a Metaphor for InfoSec. If you are someone that's going to be involved with doing uh, security awareness training, you may pick up some tips here, things you can use as examples to teach a non-technical person how to do it. But the big thing that I'm hoping is it'll just kind of get people into a security mindset. Uh, that's kind of the, uh, the, whole, the whole point of it. And one good analogy to start with, uh, we all do a lot of automatic OPSEC already. When we get out of our car, we lock it. When we leave our home, we set the alarm, we lock the door. Those are things we do automatically. They're practically muscle memory. Many people have said, wait, did I lock the car? You know, did I lock the front door? When they, when they did, because they're used to doing it, and you want to start learning kind of the security equivalents of that. Every time I get it from the computer at home, even though I work from home, I've worked from home for the past four or five jobs, I lock my screen, and it's muscle memory. It's out of habit. I always do it. And that's what I mean by getting into that security mindset where you just don't even think about it anymore. It just becomes automatic. The problem is, is that we don't do risk assessment well, and I'm not just talking about the people in this room. I'm talking about human beings, we don't do risk assessment well, and we have a tendency to be, uh, people try to influence via you know, these you know, clickbait headlines or, or whatever it is where they're trying to you know, influence you, vendors that approach you, uh, none of them I'm sure who are over there in the vendor area ever at all, but uh, vendors will try to influence you citing the very worst possible scenarios that could occur and you have to give them uh, lots of money to take care of that. Uh, but just to give you an example of how you need to kind of temper uh, that risk, I thought that I would uh, naturally come to the subject of death. Because if we're going to talk about physical OPSEC, what do we want to do to protect you know, ourselves physically? We want to prevent our death. Which, by the way, none of you are going to be able to do. You're all... I, Spoiler, you're all going to die. <laughs> Have a great conference. All right. So um, <laughs> the thing is, is that when it comes to the end of your life, there's going to be, you know, the, uh, the, the odds of you dying of something, well, you're going to die of something, but the odds of it being, say, for your physical safety, of it being murder, uh, are 1 in 229. So out of the 450, 460 people that attended this conference, uh, for two of you, I am so sorry for you and your family. But the thing is, is to put that, because it seems like a really possible thing, because you're at, uh, I think it's one in eight million for a, like for a shark attack, okay? Just to give you some perspective there. But true perspective, though, really, is that one in 92, will commit suicide. And that's kind of a bit of a wake up right there, but really the biggest wake up is the thing that's probably gonna kill you is the fact that you uh, ate all those sandwiches at lunch today because, you know, uh, you know, heart disease, one in six. That's probably how most of us are gonna die. Now, you know, moving on from that happy slide. Um, for me, the big change when it came to start thinking about you know, risk assessment and personal uh, uh, security, the big change, as I refer to it, is in uh, early 2000s, I was attending a security conference in Las Vegas, uh, the Black Hat Briefings. They're being held at Caesars Palace. And while I was up on a stage uh, uh, doing something goofy, I had tech back in my room and that tech was, the room was broken into, my tech was accessed, okay? It wasn't stolen, it was accessed. And to me that was possibly even worse, okay? Because that meant someone was targeting my tech, they were targeting the data. And I wasn't the only person that happened to that year. Uh, I, uh, the FBI got involved, it was a real big mess. And if you know me as a paranoid, as someone who's had a lot of weird things happen to them. Okay, a lot of weird things happen. I've found two dead bodies in my life before, okay? 
and not one, two. So it just weird things happened to me. So having something like this happen to me was kind of, uh, you know, that was kind of, that was kind of horrid. And I knew that I had to make a change. And I thought, well, I, you know, I, there's, I can do this, I can do that. But I started really pulling from my security background. So I was saying, what can I do to protect myself physically? And I started using just, just out and out examples from that. Uh, the big thing that I needed was control. I wanted to be able to control what was going on, and I could do it in a couple of different ways. Uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that I could eliminate as much risk as I could, uh, you know, it, but I had to keep in mind that there's some things that I just can't simply just say, oh, I gotta prepare for every single scenario. You start having to do some type of risk assessment. However, there's still something, and this applies certainly if you're talking to people that are non-technical, you have to get, get them to a place where they feel comfortable with what's going on. Um, I'm going to talk about, and this will be at the bottom of the slides, hopefully that you'll be able to see them on there, but uh, I'm going to cover roughly six, six uh, principles through most of these slides here where I'm using uh, metaphors. Uh, Reduce attack surface, inventory control, patching, disaster recovery, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'll, uh, we'll just kind of move on and I'll kind of give you, you'll get the idea as we kind of move on. But first I wanted to talk about, because uh, I've been talking about travel and it seemed natural because a lot of you I know flew here or, well you, well, you certainly traveled here. I don't think anyone here actually lives at the hotel, but, you know, so you came here and you brought part of your tech with you and you're in kind of this exposed state, maybe at a place where you're not used to being. And so just for me, for air travel, example, you know, to get out here, I needed to understand what my threats were. And I've got a list here of threats, and the upper left is the most likely threats that are going to happen to you. Uh, uh, I had luggage issues on the way out here, and then towards, you start getting toward the bottom right, uh, you, you know, zombies and extraterrestrials are being least likely to happen, although I may have to move up uh, extraterrestrials because, yes, I'm one of those weird people. I've actually seen three UFOs in my life, so that's, maybe I should move them up to at least earthquakes. But nonetheless, well, okay, it was three, but they were in formation. Okay, so I guess it's one siding. <laughs> I don't know that makes it any better. But, but anyway, so it's, you know, but th this is kind of you know, the disaster recovery thing. What, what am I looking at here is my potential risk for my scenario. Um, one thing I do is something referred to as a gray man concept, and even though this is gender neutral, uh, if you're going to Google it to find out more about it, you're going to have to put in gray man. That's just the way it is. If you should do gray, it's just going to, you're going to get paint swatches. But this has to do, this kind of covers things like, you know, your attack surface, inventory, zero trust. I mean, it's no coincidence that I'm dressed in, in gray. As you can, you probably don't know, I'm actually 24 five years old and I dyed my beard gray just, just to really commit to the part of, <laughs> of going gray. But the idea behind it is you blend in. You're not noticed as much because if you're wearing bright colors, it triggers something in the brain of others. The, the bright color does. Muted colors do not. This has been proven scientifically. And so the idea is, is uh, kind of going gray. And even if you're not into that because you've got a whole wardrobe that's not gray, just the idea of like if you're, you don't wear a tuxedo to the beach, right? You dress the part, well, I guess if there's a wedding, but you, you don't wear a tuxedo to the beach, you, you know, you, or you, and vice versa. You don't wear swimwear to a, a, a wedding. So that's the kind of thing. You dress the part and you blend in. So that way you're less noticed and you present yourself as less of a target to something physical happening to you. The reason, by the way, I keep bringing up some of the physical stuff, not just the room being broken into, I have been mugged uh, four times, a total of four times in my life, and I've been pickpocketed more times than I care to remember. So, like I said, weird stuff happens to me. You're paranoid, I'm not paranoid. Anyway. <laughs> Limit info. This has to do, again, with uh, your attack surface, limiting your attack surface. Uh, the reason, the reason uh, Amy introduced me as Bob Smith is because, you know, when I go to the, 
when I go to the, uh, you know, the, the Starbucks or wherever and they want my name, I don't give them my name. I give them a common name. So it's, you know, you're David or John, something like that. It's never loveless party of four that they call for at the, at the restaurant. It's Smith party of four. And even like at the hotel, if I'm signing the check and I have to put my real name and my uh, room number on there, that's a lot of what I consider to be personal information. I make sure I don't just leave it there on the table and then head off with my day. I hand that specifically to a hotel employee to make sure they have it. Um, speaking of hotel, and again, this cover, it's like attack surface, multi-factor, zero trust kind of a thing. Hotel safety. I never leave any tech that I care about in my hotel room at all. It's always with me when I'm traveling at all times. I just don't leave it in there. Uh, I know there was controversy this last summer. People were freaked out in Vegas because there are people coming into their hotel room saying there's security and they can come in there and do whatever they want. Uh, I just, just, even though I know there's some laws and stuff like that in place to kind of help protect people in those cases, uh, I just assume that they aren't going to be paying attention to those and they're just going to go ahead and come on in. And, that actually gives me a strong feeling of control, knowing that I can just grab all my tech and go. Or if someone breaks into my hotel room, all they're gonna get are my clothes, something, you know, or my toiletries, something that I can replace fairly easily, as opposed to the data that's on my, uh, on my laptop or my, the data that's on my phone, that kind of thing. Um, another thing to do, like, uh, that also helps with hotel safety, something I've done a, a, a lot now, Typically, when I check in, I ask, do you uh, do have a non-registered guest program? Can I check in as a non-registered guest? And what that means is that someone can't just call up to the hotel and say, hey, connect me up to Mark Lovelace's room. I'd like to speak with him. Uh, they'll say, uh, we don't have anyone here by that name. In fact, no one can contact you in that room except hotel personnel. You can't even get a call from another room, even if they know your room number. So there is a real sense of privacy that comes along with that. Uh, always, another part of disaster recovery, always be prepared for last minute itinerary changes. Uh, I've had to do this before where I just say, okay, I need to, you know, flight's been canceled, alternate flight to a completely other city that I can connect to. Maybe it's closer and I can rent a car from there to drive home. Or I'm going to be getting in a rental and driving a very long distance uh, on the way home. Just be prepared for that kind of thing. You know, always have a plan and then then, you, then you're good. Um, I'm not going to go through the detail of this. I actually did a blog post about this, so you can look it up on my uh, website. The web address is at the end of there. But getting into tax service inventory, zero trust, and what I'm going to call patching, you'll get an idea here in a minute. This is basically what I carry with me all the time, except when I travel, I don't bring my keys, and I don't bring my knife. But other than that, uh, I, you know, I've got most of this in my front six pockets, believe it or not, that are down all right here. There's something in my pocket right here down at my knees. So, uh, uh, as far as what I call patching in this scenario, uh, like I said, I've been going through all this, you know, mugging and pickpocketing. So I actually have three wallets, okay? I got my, down there at the bottom of the screen, I got my main wallet. And then I got my wrist wallet that I have right here, which I keep some stuff in. And then the third one there, I don't know if you can see it, but it's got a note in it, and it goes in my back pocket. And it says, dear thief, uh, take the included $5, go buy a cup of coffee, and maybe rethink things. And so that's for, and yeah, you laugh. I'm on my third bait wallet, OK? Oh, OK, change the mic. All right, we good? Oh, I didn't have to change that. Okay, there we go. All right, where were we? Okay, oh yes, bait wallets. Anyway, this is what I travel with, and this doesn't matter how long of a trip I'm on because I believe in the whole philosophy of, uh, uh, 
you know, wear a pair, pack a pair, you know, pants, socks, underwear, that, and I just bring a few extra shirts, and I basically do laundry in my, uh, in my room. But all of that fits into the backpack, including my laptop bag, so I can get down to one bag travel. That's, again, reducing my attack surface, kind of a form of uh, inventory control. So I can get everything on my back, and it's, I, I'm fairly mobile. I don't have to be dragging a roller board over you know, curbs and things like that. Um, my laptop bag has a bunch of stuff in it. Uh, the things I want to talk about specifically, just so I make sure I cover it, uh, getting back to, uh, and again, we're still covering, we're still in the area of you know, attack service, inventory control, zero trust, and the patching parts of this. Uh, as a part of you know, helping me control you know, my environment and, and uh, part of this inventory includes, I've got these weird things in there like a, a survival tin, it's got fire starting kit, uh, I think there's a, a compass in there. The thing you can't really see in the picture there in the uh, upper right of the picture is a doorstop. And I carry that with me. If I really want to try to keep someone out of my hotel room, I can jam that under the door. And uh, they still may be able to get in, but it'll create enough effort where I can, you know, have time to properly panic. And then, uh, <laughs> but also if there was like, say something like a, uh, uh, you know, an active shooter and I could like jam that under a door and you know, duck into a closet, jam it under a door and they go on to the next block because that's I think one in 160,000 of that happening. So uh, as far as death odds go, uh, tactical pen, that thing will, uh, it can break glass, it could be used as a defensive weapon, but it's also a ball ballpoint pen, okay? So I uh, got that, of course, a lockpick set. The Silcock key is interesting. If you've ever been walking around in a downtown somewhere and you notice these little odd faucet things and they got this weird socket next to it, Silcock key will actually turn that water on for you. Okay, that's what it's for. It also opens up a lot of HVAC uh, type equipment and uh, like uh, various types of things that hold, uh, you know, you know, electrical circuits and stuff like that. So if you're doing physical pen tests, it kind of helps to have that, and it includes some screwdrivers with it as well. So I always have one of those with me. Uh, toiletries, still same subject, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the one I want to point out is the Dr. Broner's soap down there at the bottom. I do have the uh, baking powder uh, toothpaste, uh, and that tastes delicious compared to the Dr. Broner's. You could brush your teeth with the Dr. Broner's, uh, but it's just, it's, it's absolutely horrid. Uh, but that's what I use, I mean, this is the thing, if all of a sudden I'm having to draw, let's say that uh, the government shutdown thing uh, wasn't taken care of and I was gonna have to drive back to my home in Texas as opposed to fly back because all of a sudden they just closed the airport. I have my clothes where I could you know, as long as I could stop along the way and find a sink somewhere, I can have fresh clothes every day. On the topic of zero trust, I do want to mention that wherever you make a uh, decision, uh, d it defines your perimeter, okay? That's the kind of the lesson there. So if I'm deciding between going down a dark alley, which is real short, to get to my destination, or I take the longer route, which is well lit, but still in a pretty you know, creepy neighborhood, you know, making that decision, how that affects my personal space, my personal perimeter, uh, wherever I make that decision, that's, that's what I would refer to as zero trust, because it's the same thing with networking. Wherever you're saying here is a user, here is a device, an authentication thing is happening, uh, to access data, you know, to access an application on another system, wherever that happens, that defines your, your, your network. That's, that's where your perimeter is, wherever those decisions actually uh, begin to occur. Anyway, that is pretty much the end of my talk. I hope you all have some questions, and uh, thank you very much. I do appreciate it.